Elliot, we're back. We are back. Episode maybe close to 30, I think. 300. I think I think. No, I just... 300, <laughs> yes. When in doubt, add a zero. Yes. I like that. <laughs> That's right. Excellent. That's right. No, these are going by fast. I'm going by fast. But I'm excited about today's guest because um, I'm excited when Microsoft has a new hot product. Um, when you work at Microsoft, they make you drink this Kool-Aid that makes you excited about Microsoft products that are coming out. So um, we have a hot Microsoft product, which I love, and uh, we get to talk about it today. So that's very exciting to me. And we have a fantastic guest um, that will help us navigate this conversation. And you know, for, in, in this little bit of an intro, we'll say that we're gonna talk about Windows 365. So that is the hot new product. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's so much that always goes into that conversation with us. Um, you know, we have Wangui McKelvey, I believe I pronounced that. You did. Word. Okay, good, good. I'm I'm still going through my first cup of coffee. So that's always, you know, like I'm always at risk there. But Wangui, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your help here today. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here with you both to talk about Windows 365 and get to know you guys a little bit better, too. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And actually, I, I know that I'm hoping that you were um, given the the prep in terms of how we typically start this thing. You know, we've we've learned that kicking it off by hearing the background of our guests um, ends up taking us in these awesome conversations. You know, like there's this it turns out the reality of getting into the tech space or evolving into the tech space is never a straight line. You know, yeah. that people come from all these different backgrounds. It is fascinating. We've had the coolest conversations and, you know, no pressure. <laughs> but yeah. we're, we're loving to hear, you know, where where did when do we get her start and how did yeah. she find herself at Microsoft and all that fun stuff. Oh, happy to, happy to. Okay, so let me start off just, you know, from the beginning then, Elliot. So I, yes. I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C. to Kenyan immigrant parents. I'm a first generation American. Um, and I spent my early formative years in Washington and then went off to college down in Tallahassee, Florida at a historically black college and university called Florida a &M University. I was in the Marching 100, which is one of the best bands you'll ever see. And especially if you're in Florida, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and yes. I had a blast yep. there. And so that's probably where I got my first taste of like, wow, I really like being like a part of a team. And I also got to be section leader of my section, which helped me realize like, wow, I kind of like this leadership thing too. That's kind of fun. So, um, so then after college, I moved to Indiana to go work at the Kroger company. Kroger came on campus to recruit um, fresh out of college kids to come into their management training program. And so again, I had this love of like, okay, I think I think I like being a leader. I think I like managing people, and um, and I and I love everything about business. And so I was like, this is, sounds like a good idea. So went sight unseen to Indiana, never been there before in my life. Um, right after college, and went there and got into the management training program. It, it was fantastic training ground for a 22 year old to figure out how to run a business. So think about it. You're talking to customers every day. You're working with vendors that are coming in the stores. You are working with employees to make sure that they are doing what they need to do. You're talking with HR. You're talking with legal. It's just all of the functions that you need to run a business you learn. And it was great. It was a really great experience for me. I learned how to run a store. And, and then here I am, 22 years old, managing a store of 100 people after the, after the program. Um, so Quick, quick, quick learning. And um, and I quickly realized that that wasn't really for me. I, I enjoyed the experience, but I was like, man, long, long hours. I, I was away from my family. And um, I then I came to my senses and said, you know, maybe I need to go back to D.C. So I did. And while I was in college, I actually had an opportunity to be a part of a program called Inroads that allows you to, um, kids in different communities to come and go intern at some major companies. And so my company, um, I had to go actually go and get the interview and actually get them to give me an offer. And it was at the Washington Post. And so throughout high school, um, from my senior year all the way through college, I had, had an internship at the Post. And so I had kept relationships there. And so I went back to the Post. And this is back in... Um, 1999 or 98, something like that, maybe 99. And this is when like the post is really kind of realizing like, oh, this, this thing called the internet is coming and 
People are wanting to beat their news online. And, you know, I remember hearing, and I was in the market research team. And so I'm like, we're showing data like, okay, yeah, subscribership is going down. Readership is going up. And the, the channels that we're used to are not the same ones that are becoming, coming online. And so I saw the company like really like come to this realization that, oh, like, so you, you mean people don't want to have the Sunday paper in their hands every day and like physically l looking at a piece of paper? And um, and then we they were getting ready to launch um, back then they used to call Washington Post Newsweek Interactive and then it became WashingtonPost.com. So got to start there and that was a really great experience. And then I found my way here in Atlanta. Short story there, there was a boy. He said he asked me to marry him. I said yes. I moved to Atlanta. <laughs> and so um, I came here to work at a small advertising agency. Um, and then did that for a while. I worked my way up and ended up managing the whole team there. And then decided to go back to grad school. And I went to Emory here in Atlanta, and I decided to do it in the evening because at that point, you know, I'm working. I didn't want to be poor, so I had to work and go to school at the same time. So I did that. And at Emory, I met some really great uh, teammates that were on my team in different groups. And a few of them have, were at a company that IBM had just acquired called Internet Security Systems. And so um, they were looking for product marketers to come over and they asked me if I would be interested. And I was like, sure, I don't know anything about cybersecurity, but why not? And so I did. So I took that leap and went over after getting the MBA to, to IBM. And this was an interesting time because security was not a core competency at the company. We had sort of assets all over the company and they had just acquired this big, um, this big, like the biggest security acquisition that they had at the time. And uh, so I got to be a part of some of the you know, early teams that were coming together to really build this business. And so um, I spent 13 years at IBM, most of it in security. And I watched us sort of have all of these disparate pieces all over the company. Then we brought it together to form a software unit. And then it became this integrated unit and then became one of the, the strategic imperatives for the company. And so I did that for about 12 years and ended up being VP of product marketing um, after that, that whole stint. And then right at the end of my career at IBM, I decided to take another leap to try something new, which was we had just acquired Red Hat. And um, a, one of my mentors was one of the, the, the folks on the team that were looking at how to partner with them and wanted to build a marketplace for OpenShift. Um, and so they asked me to come and would you lead the marketing team to go launch Red Hat Marketplace? And I was like, sure, why not? And so I left everything I knew and loved in security, started over again, and marketing employee number one to try to build this, this marketplace that we ended up launching a year later. And then I also was asked to lead some of our ecosystem work with our core ecosystem partners, GSIs, ISVs, and to really put a focus there. Um, and so that's what I was doing when Microsoft called. And um, just like, you know, any, you know, uh, high flyer or, you know, people with ambition, we take the calls from recruiters when they call. And so I did. I took the call. And the first time they called, I was like, no, you know, I need, I just, I'm doing this thing. Give me a year. And then call me back. And like, literally three months later, they called back and said, okay, we know you said come back in a year, but we've got this really opp great opportunity uh, in our modern work group. And we really would love for you to talk to Jared Spataro, who's the CVP of the group. And I was like, sure. And so had a conversation with Jared and just fell in love with not only him, but just the role that he was describing. And one of the things that he talked to me about was an early view of Windows 365. And I was like, you're going to bring the operating system to the cloud? Oh, yeah, I got to get in on that. And so <laughs> that's what that's what hooked me. And I will have to say, so it's been about six months now since I've been here. And um, it's been wonderful. I've had a really great ride so far. Awesome. That's my story so far. Great. Oh, that's awesome. 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 Uh, so I've got a couple couple of questions. Yes. I'm really interested in the Washington Post experience because talk about an industry that is completely changed um, with the Internet. Yeah. Um, can you give us some what what was the company going through at that time? I mean, what decisions were they making? I'm, yeah. It must have been very scary. It, so it was really it was really interesting because a lot of the people that I was work, was working with have been there, you know, 15, 20 years and, you right. know, made their bread and butter on Sunday subscriptions. Right. Like that is yep. the that was the absolute cash cow of the company. Um, we certainly they had, certainly had other channels. They had like some TV, local TV stations and some other things. But the, the paper was its biggest sort of draw. And so what was happening was 
they were realizing that the readership and circulation numbers were starting to decline in core pieces of the uh, of the, the the subscriber base that they were used to. And right. we were at the time just trying to like uncover that and surface that and what is driving that. And what what was happening was that as the baby boomer generation started to get older, like that was the core group. But then as you know, Gen X, Gen Y, and the rest of these folks were coming up, they weren't as committed to getting a subscription to the paper every day or having it dropped off at their driveway every day or even picking up the Sunday paper at home. And so we saw just this whole sort of transformation of how people were going to be consuming news. And I remember hearing some people say, people aren't going to read online. Like, and it was like, no, actually that, that was, that was where the, the market was headed. And so I saw the company really try to like, you know, disrupt itself a bit and try to get ahead of it. And, and which is why you saw the, you know, Newsweek Interactive and Washington Post, you know, initial websites go up to be able to start to capture some of that. Yeah. Right. And no, that's, that's really cool. Not to take us off into pivot land, but I, <laughs> I, um, I have to say I miss the Sunday paper, you know, and I completely get, I completely get what happened and I completely am, you know, into obviously, you know, I mean, I've been living in the tech space for so long. I mean, I'm the beneficiary of so much of that evolution, but I used to love waking up, going to a Sunday paper and spending my morning drinking a cup of coffee and reading, you know, the sort of the granularity of the newspaper. And I fell in love with that. And I wish I wish there was a balancing act on that, you know, because I I get both sides of the equation. But and I the reason I say that was on um, we my wife and I spent the weekend in the city. We had one of those city weekends together. It was really nice. And we woke up and the hotel had a Sunday paper. And I was like, look, it's a Sunday paper. And I was so excited. But um, yeah, no, I, I'm lamenting the past and I continue to find myself feeling old. So I'm done. With this. I'm done with this. Missing. I'm, well, I'm you were done. absolutely the demographic that they were hoping for. So but <laughs> but, you know, the, the rest of us coming behind, like it just wasn't what people were doing. So um, so anyway, it was really cool to, to see the company go through that. Yeah, I imagine that's transformation. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. But what was the instrument in band? <laughs> That's the one I want to know. I was so I was um I had played both the flute and the piccolo. In our marching band, we had piccolo, so um which is basically a smaller version of the flute, higher pitch. And then in our symphonic and wind bands, I did the the flute. That is cool. That is yeah. really cool. That's very cool. That's awesome. very cool. And another fun story is when we had Jared on the podcast, we fell in love with him as well. And <laughs> and, and his research and his brain, and oh my gosh, yeah. That's one of the smartest people I think I've ever virtually met. Um, but what, He's an incredible you know, human, yes. <laughs> but I think what was interesting, and I don't know if this was on the podcast or before, but he mentioned you by name. And what I think is really interesting is when I was at Microsoft, when, when you got hired at that time, you know, 10 years ago, you would have had to be in Seattle, right? And Jared mentioned that if they don't have this new mobile policy, you would never have joined Microsoft. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I literally asked him three times in the interview process. And I said to him, I was like, look, I the reason I never talked to Microsoft is because of this requirement to move. And um, and so, you know, I just need to know before we go any further, like, I live in Atlanta, like, and I'm not moving right. to Seattle. So are you sure you want me? And he was like, oh, no, we're, we're, you know, we're changing. I know that's our history, but we're changing that. In fact, we're making a big investment in Atlanta. Go see. You should go. I'm like, actually, you're right. I have started to see some news about Microsoft's investment in Atlanta. And so I but I did ask him three times because it was really like, like, wow, you, you guys are actually going to do this because for a long time, it just wasn't an option for me. And now it is. Yeah. Yeah. Funny story. I'll give you a quick funny story from when I was at Microsoft. So I was out of the Cincinnati office and there was actually an employee that worked in Cincinnati that reported into one of the product groups. And that was a no-no, a big no-no at the time. So Balmer came to visit um, our office and he mentioned, and he said, you know, this model is working really well. And he mentioned his boss by name and Balmer looks at him and he goes, hmm, I'm gonna need to call him because I don't really like this situation. <laughs> so, so things have changed, really, really have changed at Microsoft and being able to have, you know, people that report into Redmond Group be in different locations is, is going to make the company better. So I just love to hear it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very fortunate that I get to benefit from this new change in my set. So it's awesome. That is, that is. 
And, you know, obviously the cloud lets us do that. And so moment in time for us to maybe talk about Windows 365. Um, yes. I, it is fascinating to me. I I was a little bit surprised, to be honest, that this was this was a, you know, I don't pivot's not the right word, an introduction. You know, that this this new um, you know product offering. However, we're going to talk about it, and I know it's coming from lots of different directions. But you know, if you were to start the conversation by saying, you know, why the operating system in the cloud, like the way you said that, and what does it bring to the table? Let's start there, you know, yeah. and then maybe see where that takes us. Okay, uh, and so so desktop virtualization has been around for a long time, right? Um, but what we know is about twenty percent of organizations have actually taken advantage of it, and the reason for that are, are, are a lot of reasons. It's super complicated, and it requires some specific expertise in organizations. Uh, and so what we wanted to do with Windows 365 was just lower the barrier of entry into this sort of desktop virtualization experience. And the reason for that is that it allows you to have scale, you know, it, you can have lower costs, and it just gives you flexibility that you just wouldn't normally have because you're not bound to a device. And so what we've done is we put, we created this service called Windows 365 that allows you to stream your Windows 10 or Windows 11 experience from the cloud to any device. So that's a Linux, that's an Apple, that's an iOS, or a Mac. And what it does is it just frees you to be able to get take Windows wherever you want. And so, and we built it so that you can literally, literally have it go up and running in like six or seven clicks. So the citizen IT person that's in an organization that doesn't have a big team or big budget, they, however they manage their physical PCs, it's, this is how they will manage their cloud PC that gets spun up from the service. Um, and so we really wanted to lower the barrier of entry. And we also wanted to put it in the tools in the hands of the people that are already doing this work. And so we really, really focus on simplicity because we, we saw and heard from customers like that's been the biggest issue. It's just too complicated, the other stuff. And so this allows us to do something much simpler and then put it in the hands of the people that are doing this with their physical PCs. Yep, it, perfect. And so let's, so I'm going to start asking questions that I think will help us frame it a bit. Okay. Okay. So, you know, because what we've learned about the podcast is that people come to these conversations from different backgrounds. You know, like some folks may not you know, even know what is a virtual desktop, yeah. you know, that's, and so, <clears throat> you know, and others may be engineers. And so sort of part of this is understanding both ends of it. Obviously, a virtual desktop, you know, is the ability to project a desktop from, I will call it a server based location. The desktop doesn't exist within the, the actual PC or laptop. It's being projected onto the laptop from a server or the cloud in this case. Um, and, and that, you know, and what I've always come to acknowledge is that that provides a certain level of security um, structure and control yep. that is beneficial, particularly what we know today about our hybrid workplace is that you know, gosh, you know, managing security is different and yes. having a centralized approach to it can be very helpful because you don't have as much control on that desktop or that PC. So this virtual desktop experience helps there. Um, and, and I think that that description speaks to what you're saying in terms of some of the complexity, because if you're doing it on a server based structure, you know, you have administrators and all those, you know, nuances, if you will. Now, here's where I get my first question. <clears throat> If I think of my, uh, if I think about Microsoft 365 or you know Office 365, however we want to talk about it, you know, in effect, that's a an environment. You know, I come to, you know, if I'm a layman, I'm coming to my laptop, and I'm 95% of my experience is going to be in M365, right? That's, and there are many people that could think of that as the desktop, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the scenarios where I'm thinking beyond M365 where the virtual desktop matters, you know, where yeah. it, you know, I need more than an M365? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think so a couple a couple scenarios that we think this really helps with. So um, so let's talk about like real simple example is interns. So think about what happens in a company when interns show up every summer. You usually have to like get them, you know, all their credentials. You got to get them a device. You got to image the device. You got to ship it to them. They got to get it. They got to be able to log in. They call the help desk because they can't figure it out. They're, they do their internships for about eight, nine weeks. Or, and then you, they got to now get a box sent to them, send it back if they're, especially this past year, it's, it's all been hybrid anyway. 
So what Windows 365 allows you to do is they can just use whatever device they have, and it allows them to be able to stream the corporate image down to any device that they want. And the beauty from, from a company standpoint is that you can give them whatever compute you need or whatever storage they need, and then when they leave, you just shut the access off. And so the, the, the user then is completely deprovisioned without having to do anything. And what's also cool is that as they're working with you, once they log out, then nothing is left on their device. So you, you don't have to worry about any security implications or any of that because it's as simple as going into a browser and logging in um, to, to get to the experience. So I think for like these sort of temporary workers or contractors or interns, this provides a really interesting way to be able to get the, the team members that you're bringing in, the temporary team members, what they need quickly. So that's, that's one thing I would say is, is, a, is a, a way that you might think beyond M365, just getting people access to the environment that you want them to have. Have. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And and so that that was helpful, you know. And, and one of the things that is helpful for me in hearing you describe that is because I know that there's these questions. You know, if I have a if I have a PC, right, it's got an operating system in it. So how does that work when you've got another operating system in the cloud? And you answered that because you're redirecting the PC to talk to another operating system when you log in, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's a, you know, and I'm saying stuff that may sound obvious to you, but there may there are folks out there that are asking themselves, hey, the PC has an operating system. Why am I putting another operating system on it? But it's so that you can you can put yourself into another environment that's being controlled by the company. And and that's in essence the way it, you know, that's the value, and it's happening in the login process. Okay. So that that's all. Yep. What about proprietary applications? I bet that's, you know, like so if I'm a manufacturer of finance. You know, I can still manage that within the Windows 365 environment, and that's helpful as well. That's right. That's right. Um, and and the and the cool thing too is you can you manage all of this if you if you got an IT team that's using Microsoft Endpoint Manager as an example to manage all the endpoints. You just manage these cloud PCs just right alongside your physical PC. So all of the control and everything that you're used to, you get with this service as well. Yeah, a brave new world. I love the term cloud PC. I really think that that's cool and where we're going. It's so funny though, because we struggled on like, and I was one of the ones that was like, I don't know about this name, y'all, because like, do we can we actually make this work and make this claim? And the more we talked about it, the more we talked to analysts and customers, and also sort of wrestled with it internally, we were like, yeah, we got to call it this. It can't be anything else. So yeah, it's funny though, because we it wasn't it wasn't as easy as it wasn't like, easy, huh? Yeah, yeah exactly. So when do we, I think about this as a great um, service in like the educational space, right? What we've learned over the last couple of years, right, is people need PCs, they need access, they need um, internet. Um, and and when I think of a school system, they have zero to no IT staff. I mean, like negative IT staff, yeah. right? And to to provide an operating system that they can lock down and be in the cloud and be very easy like this seems to me like a great fit. Was part of your development and thought process as you roll this out to be kind of targeted to the educational space? It's a really great question. And certainly we've got education on our minds across the company. Um, I would say I don't I wouldn't I don't think it was sort of our first initial sort of use case or, okay. or scenario or industry to target. We were really thinking about small to medium businesses and you know these smaller teams that just couldn't didn't have access to some of the skills and expertise that could take advantage of some of this. But we are absolutely looking at this as a is this something we can expand to really help with the the increasing focus focus on um, education systems needing to have um, compute in really, you know, very rural areas that maybe not have the, the bandwidth that you see in other areas. And so um, we, we're thinking about all of those things. But yeah, I mean, I feel like this is just the beginning for us and we're going to, you know, learn a lot. And and um, what's cool about it is that we are really seeing some strong interest so far. And I think um, what, as we get more customers in, it'll tell us like, hey, we got this right or hey, we might have missed something. But I think education, you're right. I've got three young kids in school. And the thing that drove me crazy during the pandemic is that the, the school system just sent them all home with Chromebooks. And I was just like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so um, I am very interested in wanting to help education systems see they have other options. It might be a little bit better. Yes, they do. They do. That is, that's good. Talk about a brave new world, having three kids at home during the last 18 months. Oh, that's yeah. 
Yeah, good for you. Oh yeah, it was it was a, <laughs> an adventure and then some, but um, but we made it. <laughs> we made yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the folks that listen to the podcast know that my um, my wife is a third grade teacher and it's it's been fun, you know, and now she's back at school. But for a year and change, you know, our house was the school and watching that whole thing was funny. I mean, it was funny and it was traumatic sometimes. But oh, um, yeah. yeah, well, Elliot, my We're, husband's a teacher as well. He teaches music in elementary school. So imagine what that was like. Like he was coming oh, home. Just, he was at home. I would be hearing all kind of sounds coming from the room <laughs> with him trying to entertain <laughs> kindergartners and pre-K kids online. It was very cute to watch, I have to I, say. It is cute. I mean, it is cute. So I appreciate that. So you guys are going to have a little band happening at some point. I, I mean, that, it might be. My oldest is already playing the flute. And my young, my middle one, she's like, I want to sing, mom. And then the five-year-old, she's just like banging on everything. So we'll see. That is awesome. There you go. Got it. You got it. That's great. So um, when we think about 365, right, The I understand that there's there's a couple flavors to it. You know, so these are other questions that I've had over the last, you know, three or four weeks because mm -hmm. uh, we're it was introduced. I want to say it was introduced at Inspire. It was. Yeah. yeah. OK, great. So since Inspire, which was only four or five weeks ago, does it feel like that? Yeah, I, mean, was, I know. I know. You know, like the, this whole time thing um, The you know, all these questions come out. And my understanding today is that there's two flavors of 365 at this point. And then I'm always getting. Well, how does this differentiate from Azure Desktop, right? So, you know, you have you have that, right? Yes. So, uh, you know, for me, what's interesting is what are the differences? Yep. And then just from a product management perspective, how did you guys approach it? What were your concerns? How yeah. are you differentiating the market? Yeah, really great question. So um, we so there are two editions, the business and enterprise edition. Um, and really, it's just based on the you know, number of seats. That's really the, the key difference there. And you get a bit more with the enterprise version. Um, but with Azure Virtual Desktop, we really wanted to make sure that we created really clear lines of what ABD is versus what Windows 365 is. And the simplest way I can explain it is like this. Think of Windows 365 as a finished SaaS service, a software as a service. It's all contained, and what you get, what you see is what you get, right? You get a, the service as it is. You can't really integrate into it. You can't really strip it apart. It's not very um, customizable. We've got certain, we certainly have different flavors of the, the compute and, and variation of the storage that you can get, but that's about it. You can't really do anything more than what we pretty much prescribed. With AVD, think of that as a platform as a service, right? And so this is our cloud BDI platform that allows you to have maximum flexibility and maximum control. Um, and it can do things like remote app streaming and other things that, that Windows 365 can't really do as well. And so that's really it. If you've got, and it also requires expertise, right? So if you've got expertise in your environment, you want to have maximum control and maximum flexibility and have all of the capability that a BDI experience can bring you, then you should use AVD. But if you don't have the, that exact need or requirement, and you, but you still want to take some advantage, then that's when you might think of, of Windows 365 as an option for you. Okay, and that's helpful. That makes sense. Were you guys worried about? Oh you know, yeah, yeah okay. lots of there were lots of meetings, lots of conversations. In fact, we even you know had um, making sure that our sales teams were fully aware. We made sure that all of the the, the things between the teams were super clear to, because we did not want to disrupt that business. That business is doing great, and we did not want to do anything to cause it any harm. And so we really made sure to be careful about how we talked about Windows 365 in, in relation to ABD and vice versa. And so our teams work together quite well to, to put together uh, messaging and comparisons and how to talk about it and, and all of that internally. So yeah, lots of concern to make sure we did not we did no harm to that to that part of the business. Yeah, good. Makes sense. The uh, so oh, when Google, right. Yeah, <clears throat> I just have a question. What is the experience like when you log in? So um, I, I'm trying to think, you know, how, how we log in our PC today. Um, and then my second thing, what happens if you're not connected, right? What happens if you're on an airplane, things yeah. like that? What is the offline yeah. kind of version feel like? And 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 what do what 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 would users experience in, in kind of both of those scenarios? Yeah, um, so it's literally as simple as going to Windows365.com and and logging in. 
and, and it, it's, it's okay. there. And so you go in, you log in, you set up everything. You can a, a provision users, you can do individuals or groups. You can give them different like options. It's literally like click of a button. Okay, this person needs, I don't know, four, eight, 20 gig of, of, of RAM, and this person needs something else. And, and it's literally all oh. clicks. And right. then you just spin them up. You can create policies and apply baselines that we already have there. You can create new ones. And so it's, it's really sim super simple point and click type of interface. Um, and so that's what the, the the IT person admin would experience. And the end user, it would look just like you would if you have multiple desktops. You know how you on your PC today, you can have multiple desktops. It's simple. It looks yeah. just like that. It looks like you're just logging okay. into your PC. Now, when you work, and we're all working on um, uh, some upcoming features where we actually enable more offline support and help. But essentially, what happens if you get cut off, then when you get back on, it's exactly how you left it. So the state is exactly the same. And it's also that okay. way if you pick up and move to a different device. So say you start off on your PC and then you want to okay. go check it out on your iPad, the state is exactly the same. But there is wow, no offline experience. That yes. So there, yeah, right, right. So there, you know, like there is no so, offline experience that then syncs later. It's no, it not yet, not yet, not yet. But we are, we are certainly that's yeah. a fast follow for us. But um, but that's <clears> certainly <throat> what we what we want to enable as well. But yeah, the, so that's the that's absolutely the direction we're going to go. But right now, if you lose you lose connection, then it'll just be where you left it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But really flexible, right? I, I know we all work from home now, but back in the day, right? If when you're working in the office. And being able to get you know your your yeah. same experience on a home device or a, a like a iPad or whatever, what what great functionality that that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I see that that your I think you call it the pilot is full, which is great. That means there's a lot of people really interested. So what does it look like? Kind of the next phases of of release and, and what what's it, what's happening? How yeah. how's this all going to play out? Yeah, so um, we we did have a tremendous interest in the trials when we launched, and so we are we went back and and now are going to be getting ready to open it back up here soon um, to to um, to allow people to try it out because we certainly want to to let that be available for folks. Um, and then so you'll see us continue to have continuous innovation coming out. Uh, we have in in uh, Ignite conference coming up in November, and so you'll see us do more there, talking about some new enhancements and capabilities there, um, and then. And you'll continue to see us talk about this more and more as we go into um, next year and beyond. So we're really excited. We think we got a winner here. And so we're just really excited to see what customers think about it. Right. So are you going to do versions? or Because obviously, if it's a cloud app, you can just update great things yeah. at will, right? Is that yeah. basically how it's going to flow? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Yep. Cool. Yep. And I'm so happy that we're getting out of the land of versions. That's <laughs> You know, I mean, honestly, it's, it's wonderful. It is. Um, so last, I guess, last couple of questions here. In terms of security, you're coming from this really rich security background. Um, as you as you look at where we are right now with Windows 365 and, you know, pretty much the whole 365 environment, what are you looking at in terms of recent developments, you know, feature enhancements? What is 365 bringing to the security conversation? I know that you know, what we know with certainty is that that's on top of everybody's mind, right? So, you know, if we're thinking about 365 as, a, you know, as a product or an offering, what's it bringing to the security conversation? Yeah, and it's so, it's so important and it, you know, it impacts every everybody, right? And so I think in everything we're doing, we're always wanting to make sure that we are providing the security that people just expect, right? And it's not, it's no longer a nice to have, it's a must have. And so um, I think the one of the coolest things about Windows 65, like I mentioned earlier, is that from an end user perspective, once you log off, like there's nothing on your device. So you don't even have to worry about company secrets getting left off on your computer and you lose your, your PC in a cab after you finish your session. It's just not going to be there. So I think that that's one of the sort of designs that we put into place that just makes it, you know, really kind of, you know, I don't want to call it foolproof, but I'm going to say easier for the end users to not have be the, 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 the reason that, you know, the, a company gets breached. Because we know oftentimes uh, attackers attack the end users, right? You, you get a phishing email that you click on something or they get access to your, your machine somehow. So that is one, one way we really want to make it super easy. 
And we're all, and we also have security baselines that we put into the setup of Windows 365 so that you don't even have to think about what type of security protocols I should enable in my organization. We, we already created that for you um, as a baseline. So you can take what we provided or you can add additional to that. And so it's really is baked in from the, uh, the IT admin's perspective as well as the end user's perspective. Yeah, it's re really cool. Great, great, great developments, I think. Bob, you're shaking your head. That you know, that's the problem. If people are listening to just the podcast, they can't see the the movement here. So <laughs> I know. No, I mean it, it's taking security to where I think we all wish it was, right? From the beginning, right? And and I don't want to say security for dummies, but it, it's it's really it's it's having that baseline to start from a good security platform, right? Which is so important because I think in the past people may make mistakes don't turn on certain things and that's when you know um the bad things happen so starting from a secure baseline and having the flexibility is is so important right you talked about kind of the market that you're going after right the medium and small business and they're another group or market that has you know very few it people right and because they're trying to make money they're trying to specialize in what they do best and maybe IT is not that. So, you know, they're not a ton of resources. So to have things that make it easy for them to be able to deploy, to get to employees, to manage, and that's secure, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Um, yeah. And no wonder this is a hot Microsoft product right now. It, it's so true. And, and you know, we are such an enterprise-focused company. Like, I mean, that's where we made our bread and butter. And so I was just so delighted to see, like, the, the care and the <laughs> effort that we did to build this to – uh, of course, enterprise is going to want to use it. And of course, we're gonna, it's going to be yep. way able to work for them. But th the care that the engineering team took to make sure that this was actually talking to citizen IT and SMB type of customers, I thought was really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, SM, yeah, SMB customers, um, you know, they consume in Azure. They um, are M365 customers. They um, they do they do business with Microsoft, yeah. and it's great that Microsoft has taken a little wider lens than just the enterprise space because there's a big market out there that's really thirsty for Microsoft innovation and um, they're going to eat this up. They're going to yeah. eat this up because it's it awesome. a great product. Yeah. It's a I mean, great product. If you think about it, you know, Microsoft can provide everything, you know, I mean, just, just for a moment, you know, and I, it, it's think about a surface device with 365 as the operating system with, you know, 365 Office or Dynamics. And it, it, it imagine even a managed service behind it, managing the technology environment for the client. I mean, we are, are, you know, there is this moment in time where the whole thing is in front of us. You know, it's kind of amazing. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's ever really been there like this before. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity for Microsoft and, and for the partners, you know, to yeah. be able to put together this, you know, I, I hate using terms like one stop shop, but really it could be that way. You know, if I'm a small business and I really just want to focus on my business, everything can come from one place. And that's pretty cool. That's a new thing. Yeah, really exciting stuff. So, yeah, we're super excited. Awesome. So I think I mean, I think we're good. I mean, this has been incredible. I want to thank you so much for your insight here and your thoughts and just helping us talk through Windows 365. It's really cool. Oh, it's so great. It's so great to meet you guys and have this conversation. So, so, so enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you, Wendy. So, and then Bob, now we should pause and ask our listeners to subscribe and to tell their friends yes. to subscribe. That's right. Get it out. Yes, two guys. We're get one it. stop Wayne Gooey here. We got to get, get your, got, everyone's got to hear this. <laughs> Okay. All right, folks. Well, thank you for listening, and we hope to talk to you soon. Have a good one.